So mm. you can take the New York Fed to task if you want. Feel free. They say 80% probability of a hard landing. My question to you is something a little bit different. Are we already in some quasi-recession? What's your call right now? Um, we're not yet in a recession, but we're getting very close to it. My baseline is one of a hard landing. If you're looking at consumer confidence, if you look at retail sales, if you look at measures of manufacturing activity, if you look at the housing, they're all slowing down very sharply at the time where inflation is still very high. That's a stagflation. It's not just a recession. So your, your base case is stagflation. Uh, I, give me some kind of levels to hold on to there in terms of inflation on the upside and, and, and growth on the downside because various people are already saying we'll hit recession at the end of this year. Do you think we will? And what are the numbers? Yeah, I think that my baseline will be one of a recession by the end of this year. Uh, I talk about stagflation because typically when you have a recession, inflation is low. Instead, in this case, we're facing a number of negative aggregate supply shocks with first COVID, then we got the Russian invasion of Ukraine with a sharp rise in commodity prices. We have the zero uh, COVID tolerance policy of the Chinese government. These are all shocks that reduce economic growth, increase inflation, they're stagflation. So we end up in a recession where inflation is high. So these are exogenous shocks. Mm -hmm. and you know, the, the question is this, we're already in a bear market, in, in some equity markets, yeah. down 30% on the S&P 500. What's your outlook on equity markets? If we're not in recession yet, how much more pain is there to come, let's say, in equities and bonds? Well, in a typical recession in the United States, the stock prices go down by about 35%, where only around 20%. Whenever you have a stagflation, like in the 1970s, the stock market can fall by more than 50% because you have a double whammy, one recession mm -hmm. and the other thing is rising inflation. And in this case, usually when stock market does poorly, the bond market does well and vice versa. Whenever, however, you have a rise in inflation, you have a balanced bear. You lose on the equity side, you lose also on the fixed income side because a rise in inflation implies a rise in long-term interest rates and losses on fixed income as well. So another 15% potentially on the downside of the equity market. My question to you is 200 basis points in three months on 10-year paper. And that's the biggest ramp in 10-year years since 1982. Yeah. How much more extreme move do you expect on the benchmark 10 years as we go into that recession? Well, if uh, we go into this yeah. recession and the inflation rate is still high and the Fed has to increase interest rates, we may get to, uh, to 10-year treasuries well above 4%. So with that in mind, the question I asked a number of people yesterday, which would be, what's the lesser evil? The Fed to pause and fold? Mm -hmm or to carry on regardless, because at the moment the market says 75 basis points is again gonna happen in July. Your call, fold is folly, or to charge on is the right is the right call? Well, in my view, folding is folly because you get the, the anchoring of inflation, inflation expectation, and you end up not only with high inflation, but you end up also with recession in that situation because you have negative supply shocks. So like in the 70s, if you are behind the curve, yep. you don't avoid the recession, you still get inflation. Do you, so think, we're in well. Do you think inflation expectations are in unanchored territory to, to sort of channel Bullard overnight? Well, the latest number is about... Uh, Inflation expectations are well above 3%. Yep. And if we're folding right now, they're going to go much higher. So the Fed has no choice. Keep on tightening, even if that's going to lead to a hard landing. Let's talk about the Bank of Japan. Yeah. So George Soros broke the Bank of England. I know that was on, on, on a currency peg. Do you think the market, how do you think the Bank of Japan is going to play from here? Who can break the Bank of Japan? Can anybody? Well, if the yen keeps on falling, and it's going to fall more given the divergence between BOJ policy and other central banks, at some point inflation is going to become a problem for the BOJ and they're going to give up on their zero policy rate and on their trying to control the yield on the 10-year JGBs. So think I think that another 10% fall of the yen would imply a change in policy by the BOJ. What's the trigger point on, on yen, Nouriel, for, uh, for a switch? Uh, well above 140. And do you see that perhaps stepping back from yield curve control this year? Do you think we could trade 140 and break the yield curve control this year? Yes, because if you go well above 140, the 
DOJ will have to change policy, and the first change in policy is going to be to change the yield control curve policy and go above 0.25 on the JVGs and allow that. From, from a global perspective, I mean, there was a hint that we could have had G2 intervention on the end. US and Bank of Japan. Do you think that that's what we might get? Do you think there's a risk of concerted intervention on the end if it trades at 140? Well, if you have forex intervention without a change in monetary policy by the BOJ, that intervention is not going to be effective to stop the fall of the yen. So you need a combination of forex intervention together with change in policy. FX intervention alone is not going to make much of an effect if there's not the change of policy by the BOJ. Listen, I can't let you off the set without getting a, a sort of a boom, gloom and doom view on Bitcoin. I'm sure you'll get it in there. So come on, we're down to 20,000. I mean, we could look at it a number of different ways, but I look at it in terms of it is cathartic, it is good, it will allow a market to rebase and formulate. Has that commentary any merit? Uh, in my view, the value of most cryptocurrencies is zero, so we're still very far away from that. So I'm still very bearish about the entire crypto market. So you're still down on that. What is the one biggest risk that, that we're perhaps underpricing, the biggest tail risk in the world right now for you? Well, I think that there are a series of geopolitical risks, of course. The war between Russia and Ukraine can get worse. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen with the relation between Israel and Iran. And there is the tension building up in Asia on the issue of Taiwan. So I would say geopolitical risks are the things I, I'm most worried about.